Little Kids Rock is a charity organization that helps get music programs into schools and helps get kids, uh, less fortunate kids, instruments. And um, so I'm very honored to be a part of that as a, an honorary board of directors and uh, to be able to use what I've picked up along the way playing professionally and from what I've learned to, to you know, help the next generations to come of musicians and songwriters, and performers. How did you get involved? With uh, Lisa. How, how did you hear? How did you hear about Little Kids Rock? How did you get First time I ever heard about Little Kids Rock was uh, I, I had heard about it that, some, that Dime Bag Darrow had something to do with it, and then uh, I did a I went with Adam to a, a school and we went and played with the kids, and that was something that Little Kids Rock had put on. And I think Slash had just done something there. So it's a charity whose name's getting out there with musicians. And I guess being a dad too, uh, would inform a decision like that. Yeah, well, no, I've always, because I used to, um, I, when I lived in Texas, I used to teach, at, at first as an apprentice to my guitar teacher. And from uh, from then on, I, you know, he, he made me branch out and start teaching on my own as part of my teaching, as part of my training, I guess. I had to, you have to know it so well where you can, uh, you have to know how to play to where you can teach it to someone. There's a difference in being able to play something and being able to explain to someone else how to play it and kind of transmitting that from your brain to theirs. Now, so speaking of children, you have four small kids at home mm -hmm. and you're on a very long tour right now. Manage. Um, well, it, it, it's kind of too late to turn around and say, what am I going to do when I grow up now? <laughs> but uh, I think there's something, I remember Eminem did a, an interview or something, and he said that if he didn't have his daughter, he wouldn't have even made it, because once he had kids, it, it, it really pushed him to where he had to take care of his, his daughter. So I think that, that there's something about that that changed the way I play, and uh, like, kind of change my approach. It's not about just playing or having a good time. It, it, I won't say like it's work, like it's a tedious job, but you have to play in a way to where, you know, people have to be taken care of and fed because you you laid it down so well. <laughs> you have the title of Adam Lambert's musical director. Yes. Can you explain what that means? Uh, it, you know, it's, it, it really just means if there's a problem, you're the one that gets yelled at. <laughs> but uh, you know, you're you're in charge of the of the music and everything that's going on. But everybody in the band pulls their weight. It's not like I go in and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to play this because everybody has their ideas that they bring to the table, and that's what kind of makes the magic of a show is you have everybody's input from every one of the dancers, from every one of the musicians. Are you going to be uh, both playing and perhaps even writing on Adam Lambert's upcoming CD? I, I hope so. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I've got, you know, we're going to we're going to get together and do a bunch of writing, and I have stuff to submit to him. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's his decision, and uh, you know, I guess everybody that is in that that realm of that, you know, of, uh, of putting out the next album. A lot of decisions that go into that. There's, you know, whoever's producing it, you know, the record label. There's a lot of people who will have their input, but ultimately, it's, you know, it's up to Adam. It depends on what we come up with. I, I'm confident that we're going to come up with something really cool. So, you just never know. You never know. Hopefully. Now you have a solo record out. Yes. The Dark, and which I've heard quite a bit of. Oh. And it um, is a departure from Adam's sound and, say, Madonna's sound. Um, how did it come about? It, um, it came, well, originally it came about because that was the only way, I, I, sometimes I've become the only person that I can rely on if I want to play a show because so many other people can have so many other things going on. So when I first started playing acoustic, I did that because I could go out and just play anywhere and not have to answer to anybody. And for some reason, that's always been a, 
key to success. Uh, when, I, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I worked at a guitar center, and then that just it, it did it it didn't work out. It was uh, no, it wasn't that great with selling guitars. I'm great at selling a guitar that you should get, but not necessarily something that's going to make you your best commission. Because a guitar that make making your best commission may be the worst of all guitars. So, um, so I decided to quit and start teaching, so I could be my own boss, kind of, and then. From there, I started teaching Guy Ritchie and Madonna, and you know, a bunch of other people like that. When I went on the first Madonna tour, I had 55 students that I had to kind of leave behind to go on tour. And then the, the downfall of that is after you go on tour for most of the year and you come home, most of the students, if they're serious about it, they've gone to another teacher. They're not going to wait for you. And then other people just, some people just want to learn a couple of chords just to play around for fun at home. Some people want to get serious and write songs or play in a band or something. Um, I've heard varying sort of stories about what you're going to do in support of The Deepest Dark, whether it's a show, a, a club tour, what are you going to do to support your record? Well, I, I'm definitely playing one show at the end of September uh, when we have a small break, uh, and, you know, right after we're done with the U.S. leg of the tour or the North American leg of the tour. And then we go overseas. We're not going to be done until, I don't know the exact date, but I'm just, you know, basically the end of the year. Sure. Usually in a touring cycle, you get home right before Christmas. That's pretty standard at some at some point. So then, and that's as of now, that's going to be, you know, it for for this for the Glam Nation tour. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know what Adam's schedule is, but I'm sure there'll be another album involved at that point, and then just you know whatever could come along the way between here and there. So I'm guessing in January, what I want to start doing is playing more shows, you know, with with, with the Deepest Dark. But then I got to start working on the second album too. So that's uh, you know, there there will be shows for the Deepest Dark, but I don't I don't know if there'll be a, there's not going to be an actual tour like this, like where I'm in a bus, you know, you know, I'm probably not coming to Erie, Pennsylvania, playing somewhere. But you never know. It'll probably be more one-off shows, and then that, realistically, the tour tour would probably happen after, like the next album comes out, because the Deepest Dark is the only album that's going to be just acoustic. The next album is going to have drums, keyboards, bass, and it's almost like a cross between, you know, some I don't, I guess like a Lady Gaga produced an acoustic album or something. Uh, maybe, that, maybe that term is used too much, but uh, it's going to be, I can always do the songs acoustic, but it's going to sound massive at the same time. And so then when I'm playing live, I can do uh, do both songs and have it to where the, the problem with doing just an acoustic show is for a lot of people, it can get boring. So I'm throwing some other things in there to keep it interesting. And taking things that I've learned from touring with Madonna and touring with Adam, touring with Prong, and putting all these ideas, you just kind of, it can it can become a, ch a challenge to keep the whole audience entertained. Uh, there, there's an artist, Nick Drake, who's a huge influence of mine, and he uh, he was around in the early '70s. He died in like '74, and he um, he's one of these people that if you hear his stuff now, you like. Think this guy? Should, why wasn't he huge? Why wasn't, why wasn't he a massive star? Or somebody like Cat Stevens or Bob Dylan? And one of the one of his problems, something that I've run into, is that uh, you know when you play out, you're playing like in a bar or something, and people are drinking and they're talking. It's not that they don't. It's not that they don't. Uh, they're not like appreciating what you're doing or not being respectful of what you're doing because they're there to have a good time too and you're kind of you can become the music in the in the background so i read somewhere that that's a problem that he he had is that he would be playing these soft slow acoustic songs if these people were drunk in a bar or then he would have to change uh, the tuning of his guitar or something like that when it's just you and a guitar singing you don't have your band to fall back on if you want to go off stage or you want to change a guitar or something like that then you have dead space so that's one of the reasons that. Uh, but I'm gonna, the next show that I do is going to have I'm going to have people playing with me, 
So it's not going to just be all acoustic. 